honour to be sharing the word of the Lord with you tonight. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. And again, we take for our text, Philippians 4, verse 7. Peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So last week we began our study. We looked at Christians and people, uh, given an example of people from the Bible that you can suffer these anxieties, these depressions. At the end of the day, you're human. And the best way to deal with them, obviously, is to turn to the Lord. And tonight, we're going to carry on. And as we continue to look at this issue of mental health in the Bible, we're going to see again that God, as we've seen, wants to help us. But although God wants to help us, like we said last week, we kind of want this magic wand waved over us and all our troubles to go away. In other words, like a child with it going to his parents, they want to, to take their troubles away for them. But you know, really, we can't sit back and expect everything to change. We have an important role to play in our mental health, to play in the deliverance. And therefore, we have got to fight the good fight. Because we looked at, at today going on in the world. I mean, there's much to depress people. I mean, the media seem to be out to sadden everyone. There's never any good news, and they're always talking about wars and famines and eco-disasters and, uh, and all these things. And we talked about the suicide rate in Northern Ireland amongst young men. It's not only probably the highest uh, in the United Kingdom, but per capita, it's one of the highest in Europe. Depression, children, uh, was, uh, Pastor Jay Fallon was telling me that he was at a conference, and there was a doctor there said, I think it was children from five to 10 years old, and a, a percentage of them, and a large percentage of them, are suffering some sort of mental health issue. So it's a big issue in the world today, and it's an issue which really shows that the coming of the Lord draws near. So what can we do? And why I'm, I keep talking about what can we do is because when we realize what we can do for ourselves and how we can help ourselves, then we begin to recognize this in other people. And then we can help them because we're beginning to understand more about ourselves. And it helps us to understand other people that maybe have the same anxieties or same fears that we have. And so uh, as we look at this, we, and we kind of have to say to ourselves, if we've, well, we all have had issues in our lives, but we can't allow these issues or these past failures to stop us going forward. And if we do that for ourselves, then it gives us the strength to encourage others that may come along, that we might help them to stop dwelling in their past failures and go forward. We must, and we must not be afraid to change. That is one of the biggest difficulties or hurdles that people face is when you come to that excellent, or sorry, not excellent, but when you come to that point where you realize, I need to change something. I can tell you in over 25 to 30 years of experience uh, counseling people, you know, the majority of them that have left, they've left when they come to that point when there's change. It's okay when you build up that relationship and you be able to talk and they trust you enough that they can tell you exactly what's going on and that they're presenting issues as such, but they open up to you and, and, and tell you these things. But then when the challenges come, and the changes are required, uh, suddenly they, they can't make the appointments and suddenly they'll ring you when they want to talk to you again. So it's this tendency to hold on to our past, particularly our failures. But as I've said many times, failure is an event, it's not a person. And once you realize that, that you're not a failure, it's an event, not a person, then you can walk forward in the Lord it said in Hebrews 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin must thus so easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Another translation puts it this way. Since we have such a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. Let us run with patience the particular race that God has set before us. The particular race that God 
is set before us. As Christians, we are in God's will. And God nowhere promised us freedom from anxiety, freedom from pressure, freedom from trauma. But what he did say, he would be with us. You know, he has a unique plan for mankind. God has a plan for you. God has a unique plan for you and your life. God has a unique plan for you as a body of Christ, part of this church. God has a unique plan for his church worldwide. And it's a plan for good. And so our part in it, in it is to be willing to get rid of our unnecessary baggage that we like to carry. The past failures in our lives, which keep us kind of stuck, as it were. As again, we, we read in that last one there, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, and especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. You all remember that song, my burdens rolled away, my burdens rolled away. They're not the feet of Jesus. He heals my soul's diseases. My burdens rolled away. You know what the problem is I find sometimes? We take our burdens to the Lord, and when we finish praying, we bring them back out with us. We're meant to leave them with the Lord. We can get stuck, as it were, in bitterness when we think we've been wronged over what we believe someone has done to us, and we can hold on to that hurt. When we hold on to that hurt, we, we kind of refuse to forgive others, the ones who we believe have hurt us. And you may have been deeply hurt, perhaps abused and betrayed in a relationship, but you know something? The wonderful thing is Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. And it is sad that you had to go through that hurt. But if you hold on to that hurt and you're not willing to forgive the person who hurt you in the past, you're allowing them to continue to hurt you today in the present. People hold on to things. I remember going, visiting a lady many, many years ago, uh, over 20 years ago, I'm sure, because she passed away not long after I met her. But someone she believed had hurt her. And this was 20 odd years ago. And she wanted to know why she was in the choir in the church. And I'm thinking, you know, the incident you're telling me about is over 20 years ago. You need to let it go. But she wouldn't let it go and wanted to leave the church because this person was going to sing in the choir. You know, surrendering everything to, 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 to Christ will allow you to find the courage and strength to forgive them. Because remember, when you forgive someone, you're not condoning what they did on you. And this is a thing that holds people back. You're not condoning what they did. What they did was wrong. But what you are doing, you're releasing yourself from bitterness and anger. And it's hard. I know some people have been through some terrible things. And humanly speaking, how they can forgive, we don't know. But you're releasing yourself when you do. You're not saying to them, that's okay. Doesn't matter, you did that. You're releasing yourself from further hurt and further bitterness and further anger. And Jesus will help you find that willingness to forgive them and help you to get free of their hold in your life. You know, people have that hold in your life. People have that, you know, people who have hurt you. And I know, thank God, no one here, as far as I know anyway, but I did counsel a girl who was very badly abused by her dad. And just holding on to that, every day her dad was still abusing her, even though uh, legally he had been taken away and wasn't allowed near her. But she would not, just every day it continued and continued, and she just refused to forgive and held on to that bitterness, and it was destroying her life. You know, we can be bound by guilt, we can beat ourselves up over past mistakes. Sometimes we can entombed, as it were, in our guilt or in our anxiety or in our unforgiving spirit. But you know something? What I've found, and particularly with this girl actually, Satan's lie is that no one is as bad as you. She thought that uh, initially her dad did this because she was so bad. And she thought that no one could love her, that no one could ever forgive her for the terrible things that she did and her dad punished her for. But you know something? That's Satan's greatest lie. Jesus wants to forgive you. Jesus wants to set you free. And if you have done what some people would say terrible things, it doesn't matter what they are. No matter how great a sin is, no matter how sm small a sin is, God forgives. Amen. 
the Lord forgives to a genuinely repentant heart. That's why he went to the cross, folks. You know, there were some sins that uh, didn't need the cross, and I don't think the Lord would have went to the cross. In fact, I think he would. For the sins of mankind, all the sins of mankind. So Jesus knows everything uh, that's happened in your life, everything you've done, everything you've experienced, and he wants to help you with it. You know, we spoke in the Bible about men, and uh, well, mainly men in the Bible, but there were women too who had anxieties. But I thought about Paul as I was thinking about tonight. Paul had a lot to regret about his past, didn't he? I wonder, did he ever think of the time he held the coats of those at Stone Stephen? I wonder, did, did that ever annoy him when he became a Christian himself and underwent a bit of persecution? In Philippians 3, verse 13. Could you go to the next one for me? There you go. Philippians 3, verse 13. It says, Brethren, I count myself, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. Again, we go to another translation. And it says, No, dear brothers, I am still not all I should be but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Satan wants to remind us of our past to keep us down, doesn't he? He wants to remind us of the bad things that happened in our life, uh, the things that we can accuse God of not loving us or God not helping us, things where others that we have trusted. But you know something? We can make an a, a commitment which will help us be free from our hurts, from our hiccups, from our bad habits. And, and we can make a commitment to the Lord to leave it with him, to turn everything over to the Lord. And when we do this, this past bitterness and guilt will once and for all just leave us because we have the victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 43, verse 18, it says, Remember ye not the former things, Neither consider the things of old. Seems silly quoting a Disney song, Disney song when you're uh, reading the Word of God, but you know that song, that famous one, let it go, let it go. Well, some of us need to let it go. Don't we? Stop pulling us down. I told you the illustration of uh, the, the uh, lobsters in the pot. You know, something was dra- they always drag each other back down when one of them tries to escape. Well, our, our past thoughts, our, our past hurts can drag us back down, and we just need to shake them off and go forward in the Lord. Now, when I say forget your past, I'm not saying ignore your past and bury it somewhere in your minds, because we can learn from our past. We can learn from our past where we, have, where we can offer forgiveness, where we can make amends and then release it, and then be free from any guilt or any grudges or any grief. Let's be honest, we have all fallen over a hurt, over a hang-up, over a habit, but you know something, the race isn't over. Jesus is not, I thought, I found this little quote, I thought it was lovely, Jesus is not interested in how you started, but how you finish the race. Amen. You may have made mistakes, but when you pick yourself up, when you go on in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you forgive those that have, you believe have hurt you, and march on in God, then you can finish the race with pride. When you go through the fire, and the Bible talks about it, you will come out as pure gold. Sadly, some people seem comfortable staying in the fire, but we need to come through the fire and come out as pure gold. Sometimes the, the, one of the things that holds us back is uncertainties of the future. We, we worry about the future, and that's why sometimes we can be afraid to change. We worry about things that we do not have any control over, or do not have the power to change. And we all know worrying can be a lack of trust in God. Hebrews 3.16, it tells us, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Excuse me. <coughs> so if you have hung on to a hurt a habit, hang up of some sort, you've let it become part of your identity. So you should change that. You know, I've known people that have let their past identify who they are. And people can get a wrong picture of them because that's not who they are. 
They were hurt in the past, and God helped them, definitely. But they're holding on to that, and that's become part of their identity. People with addiction is part of their identity. I remember as a kid in Newton Ours Road, and there seemed to be two or three winos in every, every street, and that was their identity. They were winos, but you know something? When you heard their stories of why they were winos, then you began to realize that was not their identity. They were someone who was hurt badly, and sadly, they turned to alcohol. And I'll give you a personal testimony. My father was not a drinker. My mother's family could have drank Canada dry and went down to America to see if there was anything down there. And so any family parties, my dad would have had one drink, and uh, that was him. And in fact, he didn't like it because he always had to be the, the driver <laughs> to drop everybody home because he's the only one sober. <laughs> but when my mom died, my dad couldn't sleep and he uh, was very unwell with beta blockers they gave him. And so he took a glass of whiskey to help him sleep. And the glass of whiskey turned to a bottle of whiskey to help him sleep. And two or three bottles, I mean, when, it, when he died, it was unbelievable. My sisters thanked the Lord for them. When they cleaned the house, they found them head everywhere. But you know, that wasn't my dad. My dad wasn't an alcoholic. He was a broken heart and bereavement and he wouldn't deal with it, wouldn't go and get help with it, wouldn't talk to any of us about it. The only way he could deal with it was just get drunk and try and forget it. So that's what I mean about identity. You know what I mean? <coughs> he had new neighbors. The guy that used to live us beside, live beside us, Nebraniel, sadly passed away. So all these new neighbors knew was that drunk next door. That was his identity to, to, from the outside. And this is what I mean. That's not who we are and we can get rid of this identity. We, we fear change. We ask ourselves, will I change? If I give up my old hurts, hang-ups, and habits, what will I become? Who will I, who will I be? And who will I lose? You know, it was a big choice for me when I became a Christian. Uh, I went from a very social, outgoing individual to Billy Nomates, you know. <laughs> but I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. So you may have been abusing alcohol, prescription drugs, food, or you might have not been able to sleep at night. You know, as many people can't sleep at night because of what they're afraid of. And what they need is help, things to help them sleep. And these things become addictive. Jesus doesn't want you to stay in that unhealthy or bad habit. He wants you to do your part and becoming healthy. And we looked at this, the first thing that we need to do is recognize we have an issue. And that's the first step. If you go into, if you go to Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and if you go to bereavement counseling, you'll get these, this word steps. And there's different steps. And all these different uh, helps that you can receive, the first step is acknowledging who you are and where you are. Jesus doesn't want you to stay there. So even if your past was painful, and because of your fear of the unknown, because of your despair, you close your mind and you think that you don't deserve any better. Well, 1 John 4 and 18 tells us then, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. You see, church, you didn't come to this church by mistake tonight. It's not an accident that you maybe be watching this at another time. Because I believe God wants us to understand. And this is why I'm doing this series. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of despair. There's a lot of anxiety out there. And like I've said, if we know where we come from, we can help others. The church is full of changed lives. That's so good. It's full of changed lives. And it's our prayer for each and every one that they will not let their past failures or their fear for their future stop them from trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can help them by talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about wearing a mask, and we've all done it. We wear a mask of denial sometimes. We need to take that mask off. Not be afraid to reveal who we really are. It's not weakness to admit that you're suffering from depression. It's not weakness to admit that you maybe are drinking too much. It's not weakness to admit that you take tablets to help you sleep at night because you can't sleep. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and say, I need help. And when people come in here that need help, then they need to have the open arms. 
and we'll look at that later on. So denial. Denial has been defined as a false system of beliefs. Sorry, I have that on the overhead, actually. A false system of beliefs that are not based in reality and a self-protecting behavior that keeps us from honestly facing the truth. Keeps us from honestly facing the truth. You know, as we all grew up, we developed what we call coping skills. So, Pete the mic. So, just as I say, the floor is open. Don't break into a sermon here, but someone tell me what they think coping skills are. And if you trained in counseling, don't, we don't need to. <laughs> See Johnny smiling there, he's just about to go. <laughs> don't worry if you don't know, go ahead. Coping skills, drink, drugs, alcohol. That's that, to cope you with. You to cope with your illness, yeah. Fame yep. as well. Uh, well, that's true, yep. To, to, it doesn't, it's kind of uh, annul your fears, I mean, you're all anxiety, you can take a drink, you can take a drug, just shut a nurse suppressant, sorry, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, sorry, uh, just shut yourself away from people, stay in the bedroom, and if you don't That's see right. anybody, then just isolate yourself. That's right, hide away from the world. And anyone else before we go on? You can, sit, you can talk twice if you want, don't worry. No, no, no life just... <laughs> No, some of the coping skills is fighting. You turn into a fighter when you're not a fighter. Or or you survival. Don't survival. Just, yeah. just to get by each day, where's, where's the easiest kicking? You know what I mean? And that's some, some coping skills left in your hands when you don't need to. Very much so. And, you know, many young men of my age group that grew up in the, the tartan era, tartan gangs. You had to be part of the tartan gang. And... You know, if you weren't part of the Tartan gang, you get beat up anyway, so you might as well have joined them. So, I mean, that was a coping skill to keep yourself okay. So, I mean, coping skills. Alan, Felgit. Oh, sorry, Felgit. Go ahead. Would a coping skill be something that you take up to dive? Diversity from? Diverse from what actually is. Yeah. From what, what, what's your, what your actual problem is, you'll take something else up. Um, when I was a wee kid, I had a road on my motorbike. I was in a bad mood started flat out, and the Lord saved me a couple of times from it before I was saved until the end. As soon as I got to the other end, I was completely clear. You know, it, it got all my aggression, etc. cetera, right? But yeah. That was my coping skill flat out down that road. Stupid one, but I survived. Well, they call that adrenaline thrill, Val And we said no sermons. <laughs> <laughs> and adrenaline is something that helps a lot of people. But coping skills... Some coping skills work, but mostly they just push our issues to the back of our minds. But you know something, the thing about coping skills is the issues are still there. They're still there, and as we looked at last week, they can be triggered by a word, by a sound, and as I told you last week, by a smell or an event. You know, it's like an automatic thought in your head and, and something, even, you know, a word that could be quite innocent in a sense to you and me might mean something really bad to someone else. And I mean, we're not you know, geniuses here. We don't mean to say the word, but we say it. And you know, then that triggers this person's mind. I know of a girl who uh, was made read in school. And I don't know whether it was her eyesight or what, but she was, I think it was more, she was very nervous and uh, very uh, quiet girl. But this teacher used to make, them, make her and, and make everybody in the class, but, it's, but it made her stand up and read. And then you know, teachers in my day, they're fantastic today. You know, you drop you your grandchildren off and the teachers are hugging them. We used to get thumped, you know, get in. <laughs> but anyhow, this teacher was a scumbag and slapped this girl while she was trying to read. And so later in life, when, when someone wanted her to do something, she could not do anything publicly. Because again, it was back to that young girl in school standing there shaking like a leaf, worried that she was going to make a mistake and they got punished for making a mistake. So, you know, the, whatever word it was that triggered that in her, uh, you know, stand up and read this. I think that was the trigger, read this. So, so as I'm saying, we, we can bury this, but it's still there. It was once said, because we retained... Our childish methods of coping, our perceptions of reality became increasingly more unrealistic and distorted. So we've got to ask, 
Did we ever deny we had a problem? And the truth is, probably every one of us could say yes. And did any of these following comments ever sound familiar to you? And these are coping skills which people quite regularly use. You know, can't we stop talking about it because talking only makes it worse. People say that. I've heard people say, if we don't talk about it, it'll go away. Or they say, let's pretend that it didn't really happen. And there's many other coping mechanisms that, that we'll not dwell on tonight, but we try to hide away from, as Felge said, from facing our problems. And we can all think of things where we've tried to change the conversation, where maybe we felt a bit uncomfortable and we didn't want to talk about it. <clears throat> but always remember, you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. You can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. So understand, understanding uh, and feeling uh, is where we find freedom. You know, when we understand where we've been, when we understand our feelings related to where we've been, then that's the first stop to freedom. And the basic test for freedom is not what I'm free to do, but what I'm free not to do. Think about that. The basic test of freedom is not what I'm free to do, it's what I'm free not to do. We find freedom to feel our true feelings when we find Christ. You know, and a major uh, side effect of denial is anxiety. We cause ourselves a lot of anxiety. And this causes precious energy dealing with past hurts and failures and again the fear of the future. Worrying about the past and dreading the future makes us unable to live and enjoy God's plans for us in the present. And again, what I always say to people is you need to deal with your past to cope with your present and prepare for your future. And we need to do that. Worrying about the past, dreading it, and enables us to live and enjoy God's plan for us in the present. Our fears can paralyze us from doing anything, but the only lasting way we can be free is really giving everything over to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can depend on him, and we will see the light of his truth and the reality of his love in our lives. Psalm 107, verses 13 to 14. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bonds in sunder. You spoke about Adam and Eve a couple of times, uh, of how secrets and denial can separate us from true fellowship with God. After they sinned, their sin separated them from God. We all know that. And in Genesis 3 and 7, Adam and Eve hid from God because they felt naked and ashamed. And then we've got this famous verse, Genesis 3, verse 12. It says, The woman whom thou givest me, she gave me off the tree, and I did eat. Here he's blaming God for his troubles. It's the woman you give me. But you know, it's just a stupid excuse. Denial tells us we're getting away with it. He thought, if I blame God in this, if I blame the woman, it was God's fault he gave her to me in the first place, then it wasn't my fault. That's denial and it means nothing, and it gets us nowhere. It just continues to, to get the hurt in our heart. We don't dare to reveal our true selves to others. We're afraid of what people will think, for fear of what they think, and if they will really get to know the real us. You know, we try to hide the real us. Again, there's a mask when you walk into church, and you might sit there thinking, I don't wear this mask. Yes, you do. <laughs> because you don't want the people to know the real you. It's maybe not a bad thing sometimes, but as I say, we need to, if it's really trying to hide hurt, if it's trying to hide anxiety, then we need to take it off. And when we're in the house of the Lord with, pe with people that love us and want to help us, then we mustn't think that we need to protect ourselves by keeping secrets at, at any cost. Like I said to you last week, speak to someone. Speak to one of the pastors, the elders, some friend you trust, but always make sure that you know the friend you trust. Don't let it not be, as he said the other week, there, let it not be the friend who comes and tells you, I was told not to say anything, but did you hear about, you know, that's not the person to share your innermost thoughts with. Uh, the person who comes down and sits and talks to you and it goes no further is the person can help us through our trials. So what's the answer? Ephesians 4.25, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man with truth with his neighbor, 
we are members one of another. Now, we kind of read that, and we kind of think, well, I don't tell lies. But we're talking about the inner man here, and we do tell lies. We come to church, and we praise, and we worship the Lord. But there's something in there which is hurting us. There's something in there which is concerning us. And so not in the sense of we're liars, but we're hiding it again. And this is what it means. Speak every man the truth with his neighbor. Don't be afraid to let someone that you trust and love know that you're hurting. Because a problem shared is a problem halved, isn't it? With the false belief that denial will protect us. In reality, denial only allows the pain to grow like a cancer, and it takes us further into shame and into guilt. It only extends your hurt and multiplies your, multiplies your problem. But someone once said, truth like surgery may hurt for a while, but it will be the cure. Amen. God promised in Jeremiah 30, verse 17, I will restore health unto thee, and I will heal thee of thy wounds, saith the Lord, because they called thee an outcast, saying, This is Zion, whom no man seeketh after. So step out of your denial. Walk out of it. Okay, we know it's not easy, but taking off that mask, it can be hard. But everything about you shouts, don't do it, it's not safe. But God is saying, do it. Trust me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. It's safe to trust in the Lord. And I've said, church should be a spiritual hospital where these people can come and they can feel not judged but loved. And they can feel that they can get help. They can get told the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a truth that sets you free as we read in John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We, we can be powerless because of this. We admitted we are not God and therefore we're powerless over our addictions, compulsive behaviors, things that make our lives at times become unmanageable. Paul speaking of this in Romans 7 verse 18, Said, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. This realization that we are finite encourages us to, to turn to the Lord to seek his help to change. Change the way we used to live. Change the way we used to cope with life because it didn't work. And, uh, you know, one of the... the courses that I read over as I was preparing this said there are two things we have to stop doing and two things we need to stop two things we need to stop doing two things we need to start doing firstly we need to stop denying the pain denial has negative effects it disables our feelings wastes our energy negates our growth isolates us from God alienates us from our relationship and lengthens our pain Psalm 6 verse 2 to 3 have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, for my bones are vexed. David there is talking about a time when he came to the end of his emotional and physical resources. He was burnt out emotionally. And he finally suppressed his fear when he turned to the Lord. And he faced his denial. And he faced the pain that it was causing. In the same way, if you want to be rid of your pain, you must face it and go through it. The second thing we need to stop, is stop playing God. You're either going to so serve God or self. You can't do both. And we know Matthew 6, 24, which speaks about no man can serve two masters. Another term for serving ourselves is serving the flesh. Flesh is the Bible's word for unperfected human nature or sin nature. There's a great way to describe flesh. If, uh, 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 can, uh, according to the, the way the Bible uses it, if you leave the H off the end of flesh and reverse the remaining letters, you spell the word self. You spell the word self. I can see you all thinking they're trying to work that out. Flesh is the self-life. It is what we are, it's, sorry, is what we are when we live according to the flesh, our desires, our lusts, our greed, and our self-importance. And when our self is out of control, all attempts of control or, or, of self or others will fail us. In fact, our attempt to control ourselves and others is what got us into trouble in the first place. God needs to be in control. Again, the, the, the solutions for mental health, there are two, someone once said, God's solution and mine. We try to be God by doing God's job for him. 
you know, we, 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 even when we can deny it with friends, when we say, I'm not worried, I'm not troubled, I'm not fearful, and yet we do it with the Lord, even though we know the Lord knows our innermost thoughts, but we deny it in his presence because we don't talk to the Lord about it. <clears throat> God knows our lives. We need to admit to him that we cannot do this without him. When we finally emptied ourselves, God has room to come in and fix things for us. We think it's a weakness to admit we are powerless. But you know, it's, someone once said, the lust of power is not rooted in our strengths, but in our weaknesses. We need to realize that we have human weaknesses, and we need to quit trying to do it by ourselves, to admit we are powerless, and to turn everything over to the Lord. Jesus knew how difficult this is because he said in Matthew 19, 26, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When we keep uh, doing things that we don't want to do, and when we fail to do the things we have decided to do, we begin to see what we do not, in fact, have the power to change that we thought we had. That was my go at translating what Paul said in Romans 7, so let me uh, read it again for you. When we keep doing the things that we don't want to do, and when we fail to do the things we've decided we need to do, we begin to see that we do not in fact, have the power to change that we thought we had. We do not have the power to change that which we thought we had. Life is coming into focus more clearly than ever before when we surrender and, and, and admit that we're weak and admit we need the Lord. When we start admitting that our lives uh, at times have become not unmanageable but harder because of what we're holding on to, then Indeed, we need to turn to the Lord and to trust in Him. I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. One of the things I wanted to cover the night, uh, which is important and it's uh, more important that we take time looking at it, is active listening. And we'll start to take that up next week because uh, I say I want to spend a bit of time on it. But again, uh, we, we have to admit to God we need his help. You know, that's not a weakness. When you turn to someone and you ask someone something, when your children come to ask you to do something for them, it's because they can't do it. But when we become adults, we kind of think, you know, am I not a good enough Christian? Am I not strong enough in my faith that I have to ask God for help? God wants to help you. God wants to deliver you. You know, the psalmist, he said in Psalm 40, verse 12, just if Peter would come along, I'll, I'll come to a, a close here. For innumerable, innumerable evils have gone past me about. Mine enemies have taken hold upon me so that I'm not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of mine head. Therefore, my heart faileth. Everything was piling up in David. Another translation for that, if we go to the next slide. Problems far too big for me to solve are piled together in my head. Mean, meanwhile, my sins, too many to count, have all caught up with me, and I'm ashamed to look up. And when you think of that, the translation, I think, puts it a wee bit easier for us, because that can sound familiar. Problems far too big for me to solve are piled higher than my head. In other words, there was issues, and they kept building and building and building, and they became to a point where he just couldn't do it anymore, where if we deal them with them when that happened, uh, 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 and again, if there's many issues going on, you can't get help. It's called prioritization, but we'll look at that again. So take the first step, folks. Admit that you're powerless. Admit you need the Lord. You need the Lord. And as I've said at the start, this self-realization, which they call it, it helps us help other people because we know we've been there. We have the T-shirt and Indeed, we can show them what God did for us in our lives. Speak to many Christians who've had depression, who've, who've went through different problems, and yet they'll, they'll tell you how God brought them through this far. But I can guarantee you, each and every one of them will tell you, the first step was, I have a problem. And the main step was, they turned to the Lord. And God and his promises, we looked at what God will do if you trust him, wants to help us. And wants to what? Help us change. Help us change. Amen. From someone who's defeated to a mighty warrior in Christ that's taken forth 
the light of the gospel. Thank you, Peter. Let's stand in his presence.